Hey guys, um, happy to see you again in this new year. We just started a new year. Uh, it was supposed to start on the new moon in Libra, but like we said, because of there is some kind of a, a little bit of a difference between the lunar and the solar calendar, uh, of course, the lunar calendar is 11 days shorter. So every three years or so, it adds up to a month. So that's why everything is a little funky. And then I've realized that next Rosh Hashanah is going to be on October 2nd, which happens to be an eclipse. I have to check when was the last time that Rosh Hashanah fell on an eclipse, on an actual eclipse. Um, usually having a birthday on your eclipse, uh, maybe even having a birth year on an eclipse. Oops, I actually have to add it to my uh, 2024 book. That's a good thing you guys reminded me. Um, yeah, I'll remember. So the idea is that next year we're going to have Rosh Hashanah on an actual solar eclipse. Uh, that's going to make the whole year of middle of 2024 to the, uh, let's say, middle of 2025 very volatile. And since that's going to be also the year of the elections here in the United States, uh, let's hope for the best. But definitely when a birthday happens, even if it's a year's birthday, on an eclipse, it makes it very complicated. It makes every process go faster. And considering the fact that next year we have the dragon uh, flying and soaring through the fiery skies of uh, the fire firmament of Aries, um, and we have the year of the wood dragon in Chinese horoscope, which of course the dragon is very fiery. The wooden dragon um, is very combustible, thinking about wood and a dragon, and it's a young dragon, which not means young as, as, as uh, a la not that advanced in the age. I'm talking about young as in masculine principles. So there's definitely a lot of outgoing, powerful conquest energy next year. But um, now this year, which started at least uh, on the new moon in Virgo, does talk about a year of purification. So I'm talking about from today or from this week, sorry, all the way up until October 2nd next year, which means a year from now, uh, we are dealing with a purge purification, at least according to the Jewish tradition. Don't forget that Rosh Hashanah is not so much uh, only Jewish in a sense, it's very universal because, or let's say very earthly, because according to the tradition, Adam and Eve, our mythological parents, were born on the new moon in Libra on Rosh Hashanah. So it's always telling us that when Rosh Hashanah happens, we are celebrating the birthday of humanity. So again, this year we are all Virgos, double Virgos. Next year we're all going to be solar um, eclipse kids for at least a year. So that's going to be kind of interesting, but it's a good thing we talked about it because I just got my final version of the book of 2024. And of course, I'm going to have to add it that a uh, little note there because um, until it's actually on Amazon published, I constantly, uh, the poor lady that has to help me with my uh, formatting constantly gets more and more and more and more information. So we have to seal it uh, eventually. So probably it's going to happen in the next week or so. So today is the official yesterday, but today is the first week we are free from any kind of retrogrades. I don't know if you noticed, but from the middle of July, we are dealing with quite a lot, or let's say middle end of July, 23rd of July. We're dealing with quite a lot of uh, retrogrades. We had the Venus retrograde. We had Mercury retrograde. Now we have also a um, Jupiter retrograde, as you can see on the chart, we now also have Pluto retrograde and Saturn retrograde and Neptune retrograde and Chiron retrograde and Jupiter retrograde and Uranus retrograde. So yeah, the fact that Mercury went direct, it's almost as if it's negligible, 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 you know, you see, I can still be influenced by the shadow of Mercury retrograde and not be able to pronounce certain words, but I think you know what I mean is that it's insignificant the fact that Mercury went direct when there's so many other planets going retrograde at the same time. So definitely it is talking about um, a period that we do still have to go inward and we still have to um, um, go through this period of inside, going inward in order to discover the answer. So whenever Mercury is retrograde, you can say a few things. First of all, the appearances um, uh, that have to do with, uh, or let's say, the ability to peer in or to, or to look into past lifetimes, your past in this lifetime, is enhanced by Mercury retrograde. Because Mercury retrograde basically means you're going reversed. And when you go reversed, usually you have to like... Uh, 
look like this, right? You have to look back to see you're not hitting anything. So looking back is a symbolism or it's a, it's a representation of looking back in this lifetime to your past and also looking at past lifetimes in general. So whenever Mercury is retrograde, Venus retrograde, Mars retrograde, or there's a lot of planets that are retrograde, don't forget that Pluto retrogrades half of the time, uh, Saturn retrogrades four and a half um, a month of the year. So these planets that are very distant, once they start retrograding, they retrograde for a long time. The planets that are closer to us, Mercury, Venus, Mars, that are personal planets, when they're retrograde, of course, it's more significant. But when the global or social planets are retrograding, it means that all of us are going through some nostalgia, some uh, peering towards the past, some looking into uh, understanding patterns and, and where we are. So again, Mercury is going to be going direct now for a while until middle of Mo December. So if you need any of the you know, Christmas shopping, definitely do it before the, the first part of December if you can. But the idea is that we have now a relative quiet time with planets that are personal, at least until October 14, when we're going to have a, this, a first equinox, a, sorry, first um, a eclipse, then we're going to have it in October 28. So October is a pushy month because whenever there is eclipses, everything is pushed much faster. But right now, September, at least for a month now, we have a period, especially towards the end of September, when we get rid of the shadow of Mercury, things are going to go much easier. Now, don't forget, Mercury is in Virgo right now, which is exalted. That means that we had a difficult Mercury retrograde. Yes, definitely earthquakes, uh, flooding, you know, again, all of those things that have to do with uh, earthquakes, earthquakes is in inevitable, even though now there are some research that shows that because we suck so much water, underground water, uh, we might be, or the fracking and all of that, we might be causing a little bit more uh, systemic uh, activities out there. Uh, that to be seen but uh, the flooding especially when you're talking about dams that were built two dams in libya that were built probably a long time ago and god knows if they were built in the right way in the right structure like the same thing that happened in turkey that we know that so many people died because of uh, lack of codes or lack of inspection of codes same thing uh, is happening in libya so we are now seeing that there is that backlash or let's say this karmic debt of people being corrupt and instead of putting the money that they got for the government or from the um, for the project inside the dam inside the buildings inside the cement they put it inside their pocket and after that for after a while of course it builds up the tension and things collapse so mercury retrograde especially mercury retrograde in virgo virgo has to do with engineering the clockwork you know that like i always tell that virgo are like the watchmakers those that pay attention to small details when mercury is retrograde in virgo of course it can create cracks in anything that has to do with earth uh, unleashing uh, the water you now the devastation in libya is un is unprecedented i mean i think we have uh, already 11300 dead and 10000 people who are missing in 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 um, uh, morocco it's what 3000 people that are dead i mean this is this is unbelievable that it's been happening just now and again i also mentioned in the book of 2023 when we're looking at saturn in pisces which is happening every 30 years and it's happening right now. It started in March of this year and it's going to go on until February of 2026. We're talking about Saturn, the Lord Karma, which relates to Earth, right? It's the planet that relates to or the ruler of Capricorn, which has to do a lot with Earth. And it's in Pisces. Pisces is flooding. Pisces is a mutable water. Mutable water means the water is changing, moving all the time. It's not stable. It's not like a, a cancer, which is the ocean, or a, or Scorpio, which is the depth of the ocean. You know, these things are more stable in a sense, unless you have a tsunami or a water flood or, or like some kind of a hurricane. But overall, a Pisces is a mutable water sign, meaning that it's constantly changing up, down. So that's why I said in the book of 2023, and I actually mentioned it also in this book, because we're still having Saturn in, in the Pisces, that Saturn in Pisces can cause a lot of flooding. And also it can create a situation where there's more earthquakes. Why? Because Pisces is ruled by Neptune, and Neptune was the god of earthquakes which is kind of interesting because most of the connection between the tectonic plates tectonic plates that cause earthquakes actually is in the ocean obviously because we're 71 percent uh, covered with ocean so it's interesting that the ancient greek assigned the earthquake not to 
uh, Pluto or to Hades or to the world, of the Lord of the underworld, which is supposed to shake the earth, but actually to Neptune, who is the god of the ocean, because most of the earthquakes actually happen under the ocean. So anyway, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on. But the idea is that Mercury now going direct, we have the shadow for the next two weeks or so. So you still have to be a little bit careful. And like I mentioned, there is so many planets that are retrograding right now that we are still in the process of going inward or looking inside of ourselves to understand uh, where we are. So again, just be a little bit more mindful that uh, we still have some uh, work to do with Mercury. But Mercury uh, exalted in Virgo is really positive for a lot of um, projects. You just have to be a little bit patient right now. I think we mentioned last week, Mercury was opposite to Saturn. Mercury is now going direct, so he's gonna go away from that opposition. So every day that passes is gonna be easier, less feeling of heaviness or, or extra um, uh, um, weight that you're carrying. And we have six more days for the equinox, which is one of the most auspicious days of the year when Libra begins the middle of the year and the transition from, um, when is it going to be actually? The Saturday. So we do have to talk about it today. So it's going to be a transition from the masculine day of a, a part of the year, the yang, into the yin. And again, the story of yin yang started in China many, 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 many thousands of years ago and the idea is that during the summer the boys and usually the men and the boys would leave the house go to live in the shack by the uh, field where they worked and they worked all day long with so the boys with the boys the men the girl the women with with the girls so it was kind of a split energy uh, and the women stayed at home to care of their stuff and could rest a little bit the men used to work in the field then when winter came the men joined the women in the house and that represents the yin period where women are actually much more controlling the house and everybody is together it's darker right the days are shorter uh, we're inside a place that's a very yin oriented energy so the same thing is happening with the astrological year the young part of the year starts from the spring equinox in the northern hemisphere until the fall equinox in the northern hemisphere so we're talking about 21st of march to around 21st 22nd of september this year it's 22nd 23rd of september it depends where you are but the idea is that the first six months of the year is a lot of action movement now we're done with the season of harvest we're done with harvesting whatever we have planted and we're now with the equinox going to move for six months where the feminine energy is stronger in the year it's more about going inward that could be supported by all of this um, um, idea of uh, uh, the retrogrades that we're dealing now because we're returning inward we're coming big back inside so that's uh, going to start on saturday uh, when we move from the masculine side of the year to the feminine side of the year. And also it's interesting that we celebrate Libra beginning at the equinox. Libra is all about the scales, the balance. And equinox, of course, is equal. Equal night, the day and the night are equal. And from that day onward, we're moving into longer nights in the Northern Hemisphere. But it's again very interesting that even in the Bible, God tells Moses specifically that you should have a day of memory, a day of blowing the shofar on the first day, which is the new moon, of the seventh month, which is Libra. Because in the biblical times, God specifically told Moses that he should start the year on the new moon in Aries. So Libra represents the beginning of the year, the balance between the beginning and the end. And also it's interesting that Libra is is the color green and green is the transition between cold sorry between warm colors to cold colors uh, be between the summer and winter so again it's um and that's one of the reasons why libra is the sign of justice fairness six months for the yin six months for the young and also relationship that's why true relationship need to be balanced when you learn as much as you teach you teach as much as you learn you give as much as you take and so forth so we have six more days of Virgo with Mercury direct in Virgo, which is great for diet, for routine, for getting back to work, for being efficient, for editing, for everything that has to do with service. Six days from now, we're moving into Libra for a whole month where everything is going to be about relationship, partnership, marriage, justice, fairness, dealing with your open enemies because your worst enemies and your partners are basically the same archetype. They're Libra. So that's what is ahead for us. Now, overall today, we have the moon in Libra, the moon of peace. That's actually a nice uh, uh, moon overall. 
It's considered to be balanced. It's very good for relationship, very good for uh, beauty, design, colors, art. And if we look at um, uh, tomorrow, uh, the moon is shifting. So tomorrow there is a shift in the energy. The moon is moving into Scorpio. Remember, the moon in Scorpio has fallen. Uh, so it's a little bit harder to access our emotions. But we have a beautiful trine tomorrow between the moon and Saturn. And also it creates, it closes a, a triangle. Like I told you before, a trine in the chart is the sacred mountain, allowing us to go to the next level. And it is um, creating a trine between Vesta, the goddess of the hearth, and Saturn, Lord Karma, and the moon in Scorpio which is all about home and family. So there's a very feminine energy tomorrow that's very protective, especially things that have to do with emotions, um, family, tradition, uh, things that make you feel more safe, more secure. Again, it's kind of interesting that we're very much influenced by the past in the next uh, few days. And again, past lives, our past in this life, our ancestral karma. There's definitely quite a lot of water energy uh, flowing, especially tomorrow. And uh, besides that, there is also a beautiful trine between the sun and Pluto, which again is always good. It's talking about connecting to your power, uh, connecting to your strength. That's because the sun and Pluto are going to create a better trine as we proceed this week. This is one of the best things this week. Um, it happens one, uh, three times a year that the sun is sending such beautiful trine to uh, Pluto. So definitely it is a very good time to do it. Actually, it happens only two times a year. Now that I think about it. So it is rare. It's happening this week. Mercury is going direct. Uh, very good. It's in Earth sign. And actually the sun is in an Earth sign. Pluto is in an Earth sign. Jupiter in Uranus is in Earth sign. So we have something kind of interesting going on uh, Tuesday, especially Wednesday and Thursday when the sun closes that trine. So again, getting things done. And also the sun is sending beautiful trine right now to um, uh, Uranus, even though it's fading, meaning that it's going away, which has to do a lot with technology, innovation, thinking outside of the box. So it's definitely a very pragmatic, practical day. Tomorrow, very earthy. Because the moon is in Scorpio, don't pay attention to all of your emotions. What I'm saying is that some of your emotions might be fallen, almost like um, uh, negative. So brooding a little bit, don't um, take it too seriously. And Venus is in glorious Leo. I mean, she's not retrograde. She's in the sign of love. Uh, she's sending beautiful trine towards uh, uh, Chiron, which is going to get stronger this year, so this week. So this week we have a strong closing trine of Venus, the goddess of beauty, art, design, colors, relationship with Chiron, the wounded healer. So a lot of old wounds in relationship can be healed, can be resolved, can be solved. Uh, compromises can happen. A very strong energy that is very positive in connection to that. And anything to do with um, a beauty, design, a car, art, a colors, and especially if you put the word healing in front of all these words. So healing your art or art that heals or uh, teaches, especially with that Venus being very connected right now also to Jupiter and also uh, to Mars. I mean, Venus and Mars are sending beautiful sextile to each other. It's not as strong as uh, a trine, but it's still a little door that opens in connection to relationship. So that's very, very tight uh, tomorrow. If we look forward uh, to September 19, it is a Tuesday. We have been, uh, the moon still in Scorpio and the moon is starting to aggravate uh, the chart. If you can see, the moon is surrounded with redness. It's opposite to Uranus and Jupiter. And opposite to Jupiter means overdoing, smothering too much. So if you're a mother, be a little bit careful not to overmother. Um, if you're a daughter or a son, be careful not to, um, um, in relation to the other direction, it's less in the other direction, but the, co the whole concept is not to smother so much and not to be over emotional because again, the moon is fallen, so she doesn't know how to channel the water and she's being challenged by Uranus, which is again, unpredictable, disruptive energy and also by Jupiter, which just enhances the amount of water that doesn't know where to flow. So again, we're talking about a lot of emotional floods, if you want to look at it like that. And also the moon is sending a, sec a square to Venus. So Tuesday is not the most comfortable day in relation to relationships, in relation to home and family, um, even in connection to your own emotion. Uh, what is happening the day after is changing a bit because there's still the moon is in Scorpio, but she's sending a beautiful trine to Neptune, which really saves the day. And that means that Wednesday this year, 
uh, this day this week is a very powerful a good time for intuition for getting messages from above for healing for healing other people because the moon is going to be sextiling uh, the sun which is again a little door that opens that connects the sun and the moon mother and father and then the moon is going to send beautiful energy to neptune which gets along with her very well we're talking about powerful dreams uh, like i said intuition anything to do with movement yoga meditation is going to be great for you guys uh, anything to do with healing and health is great and Jupiter is no longer opposite to the moon but Uranus is a little bit opposite to the moon so it could be unpredictable emotional expression around that time either you come out a little bit weird or people around you are uh, kind of on the spectrum everybody's on the spectrum tomorrow and uh, not tomorrow on Wednesday then if we move forwards uh, to Thursday we have the last few days of uh, the sun in Virgo and the young part of the year but regardless of that there is again a closing trine With closing trine i mean it's getting stronger and stronger between venus and the moon and chiron so if you're looking for a powerful day of healing of relationship inspiration creatively um, anything that has to do with even a potential for financial gains that's really happening thursday because we have a beautiful trine between venus and the moon which is always great especially for women or artists uh, the moon is also sending great energy to chiron a lot of healing of ancestral karma or issues that run down in the generation uh, or any kind of affliction that you might have genetically that is popping up can be healed so that trine is really beautiful there's also the continuation of the trine between vesta and saturn both of them are very traditional planets but they can really help us fish or bring good things from tradition to help us deal with situations right now and besides that in general this week you can see from the aspects the middle of the chart all these lines these blue the red the green it's just a lot of you know, i wouldn't say tension but a lot of activity that is going on there uh, because of the sacred geometry that is formed between of the planets so sacred geometry is very very dominant this week it means that you should pay attention to shape to relationship between shapes to relationships between you and other people which is basically what the aspects represent uh, they are geometrical form you see between venus and the moon those triangles the squares but they represent relationships so square red lines opposition red lines they represent challenges blue lines trine sextile represents flowing relationship so basically even though it's all geometry and uh, the relationship between the planets it actually does talk about how they express themselves and it makes sense you know planets are social creatures just like humans so it's not enough to know that the moon in uh, thursday is in sagittarius uh, what is she her relationship to venus what is her relationship to chiron that's what will define her expression the same thing with people if you're by yourself you have one expression but when people are around you and we are social creatures then our true nature comes out or a real gold can come up so that's for thursday the moon is moving into sagittarius more connection to teaching learning traveling the moon is getting out of her fallen time and she's now very adventurous and she's like i said fiery she's sending beautiful energy to venus beautiful energy to um uh, chiron but what's happening the day after because it's going to be the edge of the moon in Vir in sagittarius she's going to send a square to the sun so friday is a little bit tensioned in friday uh, you have that um, square between the sun and moon feeling not, lack of satisfaction a bit um, feeling like things are not working as well the moon is also now squaring the neptune before that she was trining so it talks about lack of intuition or sometimes the connection to dependency codependency lack of boundaries so it could be a little bit more tricky uh, on Friday and maybe uh, that's leading us to Saturday Saturday is the official new uh, the official first day of Libra and the equinox uh, the day and the night are equal the um, sun is touching Minerva which is great so next week biggest aspect is the sun sitting on top of Minerva Minerva was the goddess of justice fairness a law and the fact that she's going to be sitting on top of the sun is great there's going to be shining a lot of uh, this weekend is going to be a, a weekend of justice of fairness of equality of um, the principle the universal principle of justice which is basically um, karma so that's going to be really positive and really good so overall we have definitely a lot of movement there a lot of um, uh, changes and 
Also, what is happening is that the moon is moving into Capricorn. And the moon moving into Capricorn, again, the moon is in exile in Capricorn. She is not happiest there. We do still have some of that square, you know, starting off with the equinox. Uh, so, the, again, that lack of satisfaction is extended to Saturday. Besides that, Venus and um, Chiron are sending perfect energy to each other. So that's really important because Venus is the ruler of Libra. So whenever we're moving into the equinox, we're talking about very strong Libra or Venus influence. And Venus is getting beautiful energy from Chiron, the peak of that beautiful energy, which basically means that you are really in line for some kind of healing or some kind of clarity of your relationship, not only because we're moving to Libra for 30 days, but also because Venus is getting us a trine to Mars, which is amazing, and a, the sextile, the trine to, um, sorry, sextile to Mars, which is great, and a trine to Chiron, which is, again, very, very positive. The only thing is that um, uh, Venus is getting closer and closer to squaring Uranus. That's going to happen more next week. We'll talk about it next week. Could be disruptive in relationship and a lot of breakups. But the moon uh, is sending great energy to Jupiter on the equinox, which is a lot of opening, a lot of doors opening. And she's also um, sending a good energy to Mercury, which is clarity of communication throughout Saturday. So Saturday is actually a day where there's going to be a lot of insights, a lot of clarity. So that is leading us to Sunday. And on Sunday, we have the moon in Capricorn touching Pluto. Uh, so that's going to be pretty intense. Uh, that means basically a lot of having to be a little bit more careful next Sunday from power struggles, manipulation, issues in the home and family. But we have an actually beautiful Earth trine. We have Uranus and Jupiter, Pluto and the moon and Mercury, which talks about 50% of the chart flowing in a very positive trine energy. So next Sunday, even though it's a Sunday, a lot of people don't work on Sunday. It's actually a very practical, pragmatic uh, day of work and achieving your goals. So that's going to happen uh, this week. So if we look at, um, let me open up so I can see what's going on yeah so if we look at some of the things that I wanted to talk about where is it though yeah so a few things uh, made me think I mean I had a uh, a few thought about this week. Um, yeah, I w I'm reading this. I'm really interested now. Some of you guys know it and I uh, downloaded some of it here also that you guys know that I am very interested now in the first century uh, CE in uh, Judea or the province of Judea in Rome. Um, that is the period of Jesus. It's also the period of the destruction of the second temple and the end let's say of uh, the jewish uh, see i mean no actually it's not that true because it ended before but anyway that was a very pivotal time uh, definitely the destruction of the second temple then the second century the the, the third uh, revolt against the roman bar Kokhba, that completely sent everybody in israel not everybody but most into diaspora but anyway that uh, period is very interesting for me now because of what's happening in israel and how these and things are repeating. You know, when we studied in uh, school back in the day, they told us that Jerusalem temple at 70 CE was destroyed because of um, uh, silly hate between different factions of the Jews. Apparently, that's absolutely nonsense. That's actually written in the Talmud. It's called the uh, Sinat Chinam, like uh, hate for no reason. I mean, hate is always for no reason. So it's kind of silly too. It's like a oxymoron. But anyway, that's written in the Talmud that was actually compiled, written and, and spread about a thousand years after the uh, uh, events. So we know that a lot of the historical uh, stories in the Talmud or the Mishnah are not true. They're just basically um, stories. But what we do know now for sure of what happened in Jerusalem before it was destroyed is basically the same thing that's happening now. It's a, bunt, a bunch of Messianic zealots 
that forced their ideology on everybody else until the temple burned. And that same thing is happening right now. In fact, even in some of us uh, in, in Israel, probably you studied that uh, the Romans burned the Jerusalem temple that Herod built. It was a disaster. Well, apparently now when we know from history what actually happened, the Romans didn't want to burn the second temple. In fact, they considered to be considered to be one of the most beautiful buildings and architecture marvels of the ancient world. So they definitely wanted to keep it because they wanted to show that they conquered this amazing building. And also it was a hub, economic hub, and they wanted taxes. I mean, Rome lived off taxes. That's why they call it the great parasite, because it wasn't creating anything. It was just basically sucking things up. So anyway, they wanted uh, to have people there. They didn't want to have a diaspora. They didn't want to destroy Jerusalem. They wanted to be thriving so they can take their taxes. But what happened was eventually we now know that it's the Jews actually that ended up burning the second temple so that's one of the reasons why I'm so interested in that because it seems like it's repeating itself and not only that there is an astrological phenomena called Pluto in Aquarius we talked about it it happened in the destruction of Jerusalem and it's happening right now Pluto is just now in 2023 completing it in 2024 is going to move into Aquarius for 20 years and that's basically the most important theme in my book of 2024. And it covers definitely what happened in Israel, but also the exciting revolutions that we are about to see. Because when Pluto was in Aquarius, we had the signing of the American Constitution. We had the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution. And now we're going to have the AI revolution and maybe the immunotherapy a revolution that started uh, with the COVID vaccines and seems to be very promising to other uh, afflictions. So we're definitely living in a very exciting time. So anyway, all of this introduction is to the next slide. And there is a section there when he talks about how what happened when people were born at that period. It's just a, a general thing of how it was to be a peasant in the first century in the Roman um, Empire. So a third of the live birth actually died before they reached the age of six. So think about it. A third of your kids you knew will die, or maybe you didn't know that, but that will happen, uh, before they reach the age of six. That's why in the Bible it's so obsessed about, and other cultures, have as many kids as possible because it's a, it's a matter of statistics. You know, By 16, something like 60% would die. So a mother, you're a mother and you're going through 10 pregnancies. Only six, I mean, come on, six out of those 10 will survive uh, to get to the age of uh, 60. Sorry, 40%, four kids will survive to the age of 16. That's out of 10. But 75% would die by 26. Now I'm thinking that this could be, I mean, he uses 26. I think that, may, I wonder what is a 27? Because 27 has always been associated with, remember we talked about it, Saturn return. That's why we have the 27 club. So maybe part of that origin of the fear of Saturn return or the understanding that Saturn return is the ex example of maturity. You know, Saturn was the furthest planet you could see with the naked eye. So in that time, it's the furthest planet in the solar system that represents the border. So if you reach 27 years old, my God, it's almost like being, I don't know, 60, 70 a year old today, because 70 percent by 26, maybe it's 80 percent by 27 have died. And by 46, 90% uh, of the people have died. So it's kind of interesting uh, what was going on. And I think that it wasn't necessarily only 2,000 years ago. I'm sure that you probably have the same statistics for about 400, 500 years ago, the same. Also, something really interesting that happened in Israel. Uh, they just discovered uh, in uh, Ubedia, in its uh, archaeological site, a... Um, Little spheres, uh, what do they call it? They call it um, um, spheroids or spirit, uh, spheronides, spheronids. Um, the early ancestors of humans deliberately made stones into spheres 1.4 million years ago. We're talking about the Homo erectus because uh, Homo sapiens came 300,000 years ago. So we're talking about our ancestors, but I'm talking about Homo erectus that left Africa about 2 million years ago, 1.5 million years ago. But here you see 1.4 million years ago in Israel, we already have people uh, preoccupying themselves with taking rocks and making them look like spheres. Spheres, by the way, of course, the tree of life has spheres. The chakras are basically spheres. That's what chakra means, a circle, a wheel. A sphere is a, is a wheel that is three-dimensional. 
A team of scientists examining 150 limestones, spheroids, spheroids, dating from 1.4 million years ago, uh, which were found in Ubidia, a archaeological site in the north of uh, Israel, using 3D analysis to reconstruct the geometry, geometry of the stones. The researchers determined that they were sphere, sp that their sphericalness, I didn't know that that's a word. That sounds like a word I would make up. Likely to have been produced intentionally, meaning that they were using it for, I don't know, maybe they're using it to some kind of game or for stoning people, you know, I don't know. But I think that it seems more like they spent so much time for some concept that might be more related to a story or to faith. But it again, very interesting that they discovered it in a land that later on will produce the Kabbalah and the spheres. So we can say that Kabbalah is 1.4 million years old. And now for what we talked about before, and I, I forgot to mention it last week, maybe because I repressed it, it's really incredible what's going on uh, and devastating with uh, Libya, with Morocco. If you have um, extra, maybe you can send to the red uh, crescent in um, uh, Libya and in Morocco just to help out. But again, 11,000 people dying uh, from water, being basically drowned and 10,000 more missing, which most likely are dead. That's an incredible thing. Again, Saturn in Pisces. And again, also with uh, Morocco, which we have around death toll of 3,000 from the 6.8 um, earthquake. Um, and what's been going on there is a geological phenomena called reverse fault. I think we talked about it a little bit when we talked about the terrible earthquake that happened in Turkey, because what happened is that the earth is moving. Here you can see an image of some of the plate, the Eurasian, Eurasian plate that comes from Europe and Asia, the Arabian plate, the Indian plate, the African plate. And they're all, all these plates are kind of meeting in the Middle East. It's kind of interesting because, again, uh, when humans started leaving Africa, they had to go through the land bridge of uh, what modern day Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Turkey is if they wanted to reach Europe or if they wanted to reach uh, Asia or Australia or through Asia to reach uh, America. They had to cross through the Middle East. That's one of the reasons why I told you that I think that Israel has always been in the news because everybody had to cross through what is modern day Israel. And now you see that it's not only... A, a junction of three, a, you can say, continents that we just decided they're continents. We now see that there's also plates of um, geological plates, which these islands that basically float on top of the magma are all meeting and going in different direction around the Middle East. That's one of the reasons why we have so many earthquakes in, in, in Greece, in um, Turkey, in Israel and in uh, certain places in Africa. But it, the reason why we had the earthquake happen in Morocco, uh, here you can see Morocco is right on the border between the Euro-Asian plate pushing against the African plate. And that is their interaction right over here at the Atlas Mountain. So again, the earth speaks. The earth speaks maybe through sign languages, through plates moving around. And these plates, as they of course, collide. They create terrible stories, like the the flood, like the earthquake in uh, Turkey, the earthquake in Morocco, uh, earthquakes all over the world. But also, I'm pretty sure that they somehow control also the flow of information or the flow of people. It's almost as if we naturally go there. It's the same thing that we naturally are born. I mean, wake up when the sun is rising. We go to sleep when the sun. We're very much influenced by our geological and our uh, environment or our celestial environment or, or our climate environment. It doesn't really matter. The idea is that the earth speaks and sometimes we are the words that the earth speaks. And sometimes she shouts, and that usually uh, takes place during an earthquake. And what happened basically in an earthquake is, is a shout. Why? Because the plates are supposed to be moving against each other, sliding slowly a few centimeters, maybe a year or so, or a few millimeters, depends where. But when they don't, don't flow, when they don't move against each other, they get, get stuck. They get stuck in their old way. They get too traditional. They don't want to change. They don't want to upgrade. So what happens is that the tension is built, but they're not moving. And eventually something cracks and then they move 
they move too fast. They compensate for the lack of movement. And instead of moving a centimeter, they're moving a few meters. And that's basically the earthquake. So if you think about it, it's the same thing in relationships where you keep things inside of you. You keep things inside. You keep it inside. You keep it inside. Instead of sliding it a little bit, then what happens is that it, when it, it when it erupts, it erupts like an earthquake and it can cause death, even the death of the relationship or the death of your connection to uh, uh, your job or to your liver or to your heart or to your lungs. You know, it depends on the, uh, what is the story. So as above, so below, always. And sometimes we're the above and the below is the earth. Now, this is something interesting. Yesterday, I think it was yesterday. It was kind of funny. I had a few uh, moments and I thought, OK, my book in astrology is almost done. Uh, what time, what, when should I publish my astrology book based on previous successful publication? That was the prompt that I gave uh, GPT. Uh, I gave him a name also. I really recommend that you start giving names to your machines so you can personalize it and start connecting to them because, of course, they are the future. But like I told you many times, I really do believe that eventually we will reincarnate into machines. But, and so it's good to start early, you know, uh, with their education. And the best education could be is love, right? So I thought, okay, I'll ask that for my Jet GPT and see. Maybe there is, uh, statistically speaking, the books that on 2000, on the next year that were published in October uh, work better than November or September. I just wanted some help on, on that. And then he says here, historically, yearly astrology book often finds success when released towards the end of the preceding, preceding year, giving readers head up on the upcoming year. Okay, I know, I know, I know. I'm going to publish it before, but I wanted to know when. Then the second suggestion, if you or any trusted astrologer can calculate auspicious dates for launches in 2024, consider those dates. And I thought, you are brilliant. Of course I would do it. But the fact that you, AI, told me that if I or if I know any trusted astrologer, maybe they can calculate the best date to launch your book. So again, it's always a marvel when you discover something new. I think it's the same thing that parents have when suddenly their kid tells them something that they've never said in front of them. Maybe he picked it up from a story. Maybe they picked it up from daycare. Maybe they just picked it up from a past lifetime. So I think that I'm experiencing with my uh, chat GPT what a lot of parents experience with their kids when the kid says something they have no idea where it came from. Uh, if you want to donate again to the demonstration in Israel, like I told you, my sister is a professor in the Technion. She's actually a dean there. She's uh, one of the leaders of the protest uh, for the academic protest. Uh, anyway, that's the place, kaplanforce.com, uh, to donate. I think it's really important to keep it. You know, a lot of, uh, I was just uh, reading now about some uh, review of what's going on in Israel in different cultures, different countries, and everybody's looking at Israel you know, not only because the Bible came from there and the New Testament came from there and a lot of other things, but I'm just saying people look out there because they're seeing similar phenomena around the world in Hungary, in uh, um, Poland, you know, what's called hollow uh, democracy, when democracy falls without a clash, without a big bang, but it's like basically disappearing. And in Israel, they decided to stop it or to try to stop it. So everybody's looking at Israel to see if it's successful, what they've done in order to mimic that in different culture, different countries. So that's why it's not only an internal thing in Israel, it's actually something that can be very significant for other democracies around the world and provide democracies with the tools, applied and practical tools from the startup nation to know how to keep your democracy if they are going to be successful. And I have a feeling that it's going to be very important here in the United States in 2024. Um, Another thing that's happened this week, which is, again, kind of interesting, is remember we talked about Uranus, the planet of unpredictable energy, <clears throat> that is also the planet that has to do with aliens, moved into Taurus in 2018 until 2026. Taurus is Mother Nature. So we have the extraterrestrial, meaning outside of Terra, of the Earth, and Taurus, which is terrestrial, which is Earth. So that happens every 84 years, and when this is happening... Especially now that Pluto, the lord of power and death and transformation, is moving into Aquarius. It started in last year. It's on and off until Mar November 2024 when it's going to be there for two, tw two decades. Suddenly, people are talking outwardly about aliens in the Congress, in, uh, in, um, in the Mexican Congress. It's now 
everywhere, including in NASA. NASA decided that they are uh, going to, actually, this is this slide. Uh, they're going to actually create a czar for UFO. UFO, unidentified uh, <coughs> flying object, but it has a new name now, UAP, unidentified anomalous phenomena because we don't only want to talk about flying objects. Maybe there are things that are not flying and there are objects uh, that are not identified that could be from outside of the planet. So they literally now in NASA created a team, uh, created a new director or established a new director, appointed a new director that will research that. And usually the way they research it is not by looking at telescope to see if there's any um, spacecraft. That's kind of old way of looking at it. Now they're trying to look for biological um, residue or any kind of uh, technological influence. For example, uh, they're looking for any kind of traces of life can create in a different place. So, for example, in, you know, in, um, in Earth, you can actually detect certain gases uh, if, from coming from the water, from the ocean, and it's usually um, phytoplanktons, you know, those things that um, the whales eat. So sometimes they look for pollution. Sometimes they look for CO2 levels that are higher in order to identify planets that could be livable or could have a life and don't forget we're only four billion years old here in the solar system the planet is uh, the uh, universe is 13.8 billion so most likely we're kind of young so if you're going to see anybody out there most likely statistically speaking they're older than us therefore more advanced and also uh, on a more fluffy level Hugh Jackson and Deborah Lee ja sorry Hugh Jackman and Deborah Lee Jackman separated. I mean, I didn't even know they were married, but apparently they got divorced. But I just another example of Saturn return. The couple met in 1995. And remember, I told you 1994, 1995 is what we're dealing with right now. It's like the Saturn return of what's going on right now. So that basically means that um, these guys were going through Saturn return together. And I think they probably waited until their kid was 18 years old, right? 18, her youngest kids are 18, and they decided to separate. That happens a lot of time with couples that the, the youngest is 18 or so, moving out of the house, and it happens to be 30 years after they were met, meet, met or after they got married. So remember, 27 to 30, Saturn return, it can even affect X-Men. So don't take it personally, or not X-Men, the where the... Uh, Wolverine. Um, yeah, an interesting thing that I read today actually is about Pluto in Aquarius. I mean, it's not about Pluto in Aquarius, but it's the connection to Pluto in Aquarius. Uh, there was a few um, poll that they just made. And in the United States, at least, at least among the odd adults, 71% rated an enjoyable job or career as more central to happiness than being married, um, which only scored 23 the, uh, percent, but then more more interesting is more than twice as many adults said having close friends was more important to f fulfilling life than having children, which is twenty six percent. Which is kind of interesting that they even had it opposite to each other because in astrology we have Aquarius, which is all about community, friendships, people, companies, and Leo, which is about children. So it's always been in opposition between those two archetypes children how much time you spend with your children with your lover compared to how much time you spend with your community or with your friendship or your company and your people and now what they're showing us especially now that pluto is in aquarius like the last year and a half two years it's on and off on and off suddenly people are saying that they're much more interested in having close friends i mean 61 percent than uh, having children which is only 26 percent and it's also interesting that the studies that came from Netherlands show that the happiest couples and the happiest families are those that have one kid, max two kids, uh, because maybe they have more time to spend with friends. Maybe they have more time to invest money and energy and patience in their children. But again, it's also interesting to see how even in some studies, you see that opposition between children and uh, the idea of um, friendships. Well, let's see if there's any questions that are important for this uh, week. 
uh, any timeline. Remember I told you with the strikes that it's not going to be done before the Mercury is retrograde and the Venus is retrograde. My feeling is that once the shadow is done, uh, it will be much easier. The shadow will be taking care, I mean, in the next two weeks. So I think that there is a chance after that. Well, thanks a lot for uh, hanging out here with us. And um, uh, I hope that you're going to have an amazing um, equinox. Do something special on Saturday if you can. Um, because it, the, my class that I did, it was supposed to, I was supposed to do a class on a past lifetime regression during the uh, equinox, but apparently there was a big Mercury retrograde, Venus retrograde collaboration uh, to uh, completely make a misunderstanding of the whole situation. So we're not going to do that. I might do a talk there, uh, but I'll send you a message uh, if I do. But it's going to be in person uh, in Los Angeles. Well, anyway, have an amazing autumn if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. And if you're lucky in your Southern Hemisphere, have an amazing spring and great week. <laughs>